Welcome back to another episode of Isolation Cast. I'm your host, Maddie Limerick, and today I'm joined by a theater artist and one of my best friends, Hannah Katz. Hannah, welcome to Isolation Cast. Hi, Isolation Cast. Hi, Matt. <laughs> so this is something that you and I do several times a day, especially now that we have some time that oh, we yeah. can <laughs> talk for a little while. So, but why don't you tell the audience at home who you are, a little bit about yourself, and we'll launch in. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is my first podcast, so forgive me if this is clunky. <gasps> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy. Um, so my name is Hannah Katz, if you haven't heard it enough. Um, I graduated from Florida State University in 2018. Go Knowles. Um, I am a theater human, I like to call myself lately. Um, which means that my first passion is directing and I love it a lot, but I like a lot of it. And I like talking about theater as a whole, as a concept. Um, I'm really big into storytelling and I'm also really big into travel when the world is not ending. Um, so I went to a few countries and I ended up actually living in Japan last year in 2019, which was this really cool experience. Um, and yeah, I like to cook and bake also as a side note, and I'm very good at it. So that's fun. <laughs> uh, I love it. What's your sign, Hannah? I'm having everybody say what their sign oh, is. Oh, I love I that. It says a lot about people. Well, I'm a cancer and my, like two of the like three leading signs are cancer. I like to say I'm like the canceriest cancer. Um, so it's just yeah, really true. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I, I totally see that with you. Yeah. Um, so... I know, like, you and I, are, I, I enjoy our friendship because we can be very frank with each other and we're very honest mm -hmm. um, in a way that, like, I haven't had a friendship like that before. So, like, we've had days where, like, we've been able to, like, pass through the kind of, like, doldrums of what's happening. Um, also, because, like, you went from being in the front lines of, like, what was seeing what was happening in Asia when you were living in Japan in the end to then coming back to the States and now the States are kind of there. So yeah. um, <laughs> what are you, is there anything you're doing right now to kind of, um, kind of push through to continue to like in, in nourish yourself as an artist? Are you creating anything? Are you, what are, what are you doing to kind of uh, give your, give your art soul a little life right now? Yeah. So originally I was like you mentioned in Japan when Corona was starting in China and that was a really interesting thing of like, nobody really thought it was that bad until they closed Disneyland and they postponed things for Lunar New Year. And I was actually supposed to go to Shanghai during that time and decided to cancel that trip. And what I did to nourish my soul back then was travel to somewhere different. So I went to Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island of Japan. And I actually got to see snow for the first time at 23 years old. So I think new experiences are like a really cool way to nurture your soul and like keep thinking and be motivated, um, which is something we can still do even in this place in America and this time and quarantine things. Um, and now what I'm doing that I'm back in the States and I'm in the same time zone as everyone, which is really nice, um, is uh, I started a virtual play club with a great friend of mine named Thomas Globley. And Matthew, you're actually part of virtual play club. I am. Um, I am. <laughs> and it's really good and fun. So we're reading um, a play. We were doing the first week, I think we did a play a day. Um, but that's not working for everyone's schedule. So I think we're going to a play every two or three days now. Um, and we just call each other after we read it at 8 p.m. And um, we talk about kind of, you know, like all the things you do in play analysis class. And um, we also just talk about like there was a play that most of us just did not like one time. <laughs> and we were just like, why don't we like it? Because lots of other people do. Yep. We're not, I'm not going to say the name nope. of this play because it is a widely, widely appreciated slash produced slash uh, used in education play. And it's a good play. Um, I, I know it's a good play, yeah. but like it was really interesting that we all had just a visceral reaction. And so kind of mm -hmm. reminding yourself, A, that it's okay to have opinions and be like having opinions with people. And then like 
discussing them? Oh my god, how it sounds so stupid, but it is so important. <laughs> and also, I think for some of us, like we leave school and it feels really hard to have that space to do it again. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for me it really was, especially when I was living in Japan, it felt like I had like no connection to certain things anymore. Like I was seeing a lot of art. I was so lucky. I was in a city with great museums and really cool things, but I felt really disconnected. So it's really funny to me that like in this time of quarantine, I'm becoming connected again with the things mm -hmm. that I love. And I'm kind of grateful for that space in a weird, 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 weird way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think you and I both at the same time kind of hit a little bit of a point where we were a little burned out on theater or theater people or just the kind of like thing, some of the, the emotional aspects of what go into theater. Mm -hmm. And like for me, like as I've been finishing my program, it's sometimes I forget like why I've loved theater. And I've just been so charged uh, when we've been talking about things and it's been so nice. And um, also to like go, you know what, this place still has merit, but it's okay if we don't like it. Like we don't have to love this. Totally. Uh, but we can still see that there's some merit in some things, which I love. And also, you know, sometimes like there was one play a couple of to go where you know uh, one of the other people and I had very similar views and then you were like you know what I just I can't agree with that and <laughs> I you know what it's it's one of those that I like it's a space where all of us you know and theater people tend to have strong personalities a lot of the times and so you and I both I think have very strong personalities but it's in such a respectful way of like what physically works for us at that time or what emotionally is working for us at that time um and so, yeah, it's been really nice. And I know I jumped in after you guys started, but um, it was, yeah, it's been absolutely lovely to look forward to. And while I'm still like having to do stuff with school, I still was like, oh no, I'm going to find time to reread this. Oh, oh no, I'm going to find, I'm going to find time to do this just because it's like, okay, I've been funneling so much time into actually getting my classes and stuff online mm -hmm. because of uh, teaching, uh, yeah. which has actually taken way more time than I expected it to. Um, but yeah, so it's been, it's been so nice. So thank you for that. No, no. Um, like, seriously, it's so good to do this. Like, I, I just, I'm, I feel so lucky that like we have a group. Um, mm -hmm. I think like you mentioned earlier burnout and I think it's really true. Like as a younger, I'm still a very super young artist, but as an even younger artist, I found it really hard to know what was my personal life and what was my professional life. And that was what like kind of led me to take a step back and end up traveling, which I ended up like loving even more than I thought I could love. And like, mm -hmm. I'm really lucky the way that you know, it, it worked out, but, um, it was so nice to like know that other people were experiencing that. And then also at the same time do this where it is mm -hmm. just my personal love of theater and I don't have to make it professional. Um, in the same way yeah. where like, um, so Matt and I met at Barrington, um, and, uh, that was a great experience. We were both interns and mm -hmm. we learned so much mm -hmm. that summer. I like to say I learned as much in like three months at Barrington as I did in the first two years of school. Um, mm -hmm. Just because school was great because it gave me the backbone of theory that I will like never not use. I use it still now. Like if I'm not doing yeah. theater work at the moment necessarily, but getting to put it in practice there was like incredible. And I like, that was a great experience. But it was also a professional experience. And sometimes, since that was my first anything professional, I didn't know how to be as personal with my like ex connections. And so <laughs> to have a space that is both theatrical and solely personal, like mm -hmm. it's so nice because maybe this is really selfish, but I, except for one person in the group, I knew everyone <laughs> before virtual play club started. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Glogli brought in one of his friends who he met in Tampa, but we had a night with just the two of us and her because of the way schedules worked out. And she's lovely. I really like her. And she feels like very much part of the tribe. And it's mm -hmm. so nice to have that little 
kind of connection where you said you can mention you like you and um, a great member of our group, Jackie Campos, were really on the same page about this play. And I was like, I'm I love this perspective, but totally not what I was thinking at all. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. and it was so nice to just like pleasantly disagree but not disagree like yeah. have different interpretations and I don't know I feel so happy also I feel really grateful because everyone in our group knows how to raise dissenting opinions in a really interesting respectful cool mm-hmm. way where nobody is arguing with each other we're literally just saying like wow hadn't thought of it like that like I I thought like this, but I like this. And like, are they similar? Are they different? It was really cool. And I'm just, it's like making my heart very happy every time we log on. Yeah, it's, it's lovely because I think we're so used to daily on the internet. Um, there's, you know, everyone argues about everything or everyone's opinion is the best opinion, mm. which I am very guilty of this, especially <laughs> when it's media, especially when it's media that I care about or I feel very passionately mm. against. Like there are some entertainment properties that I just, that everyone else really likes that I just think are kind of tacky. If you again, are going to fight me on the fact that the carousel of progress is the best ride at Walt Disney World, we're going to have a problem, buddy. <laughs> Why would I ever okay, fight Okay, just check it. I'm not going to say that it's the best <laughs> ride at Walt Disney World, but let me tell you, there is not a better 15 minutes in air conditioning in Disney, in, in like, <laughs> The Magic Kingdom, then the Carousel of Progress. I can't tell you how many friends of mine, because, like, at UF, we're only 90 minutes from Orlando, Mm -hmm. which, you know, everyone's like, that's so far. But I was like, are you... That was my commute from Brooklyn to Times Square when I lived in New York. (laughs) So, like, for me, that's that's just, like, a work commute. So, like, I, you know... But the other day, someone was like, yeah, I rode the Carousel of Progress for the first time. And I was like, you did a college program. You've been to Disney so many times. And she was just like, yeah, I just, I, you know, because she came from the West or mm-hmm. East Coast. So she was like, yeah, or I'm sorry, the West Coast. And so she was like, yeah, we just didn't have it at Disneyland. So I just had never done it. And I was like, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Shining at the How end of you? every day. <laughs> Listen, I might have watched a 4D, 4 4K HD ride through of that every day for the last week. <laughs> And hummed it because I am, it's real easy to be sad right now. And like my county just instituted a stay indoors order for, I believe, 14 or 21 days, one of the Mm two. And like Disney properties are supposed to reopen next weekend, but let's be honest, I doubt that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, No, you know, no tea, no shade, but it's just, I think they're trying to be as responsible as possible and everybody else needs to be as responsible as possible. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, it's it's that thing of I would never fight you on that because I love <laughs> Carousel of Progress. Um, and I also love that, like, you and I can just, like, talk about Disney I'm, for... Yes. <laughs> and especially Disney, especially Disney parks because um, you and I have similar perspectives on the beauty of storytelling on a large scale, but also nonverbal storytelling yeah. in a way that Disney... Nobody but Disney does nonverbal storytelling. And it's been a shame with every time we get kind of new leadership, every time we get new leadership that um, that tends to go away a little bit. They'll keep it for some things, but then that goes away on like, you know, when the Disney Springs reopened and they weren't as like, heavy on the theming is even Pleasure Island was. Mm -hmm. So it sucks, but like, it's a thing. I think that's a really interesting point you bring as well, which is like part of the reason I always really, really enjoy talking to you, um, right? Like we can talk about storytelling in so many different ways, right? So we've talked about Disney parks a lot, um, which is like another thing that obviously brings both of us joy. But it's so interesting because like the reasons it brings us joy is like a little different, but a little bit the same. Um, so I think like, of course, we both have like this deep nostalgia, which is like a very powerful thing. Um, but I also like love the universality of them. Like I always used to joke, like whenever I was really homesick in Japan, I would just go to Tokyo Disney um, uh, because it's just like, I, I mean, I it's I love it. It's familiar. <laughs> 
Not even going to lie, all of the signs are in English. So if you ever feel really, really overwhelmed and you live abroad, go to a place where it's very touristy and all the signs are in English and you feel silly, but like also you can read without asking a question when you're starting, which is just a underappreciated feeling. Um, And also, like you said, it's so interesting the way they do storytelling. Um, So you just get like a lot of that. And it's so, what's crazy to me is like, okay, I don't know if this is bringing me joy or not, but it's definitely like an interesting thing that's keeping me going through quarantine is I've sent these to you. So I know you've seen them is all the videos of these families reenacting Disney. Like they have the magic band touchstone on their iPad. It's like, it's a little crazy but also like I'm fascinated by it, but also I love it because like it just shows you that this like storytelling device is like running in people's blood in a way that like I kind of tend to skepticize during the Instagram time of things when you can go to the park every day that it's to take a picture and to like say, oh, today I went to Disney. But actually like we're seeing this incredible deep love and nostalgia for these rides there was one I saw last night that I think was on your page was um, the Spaceship Earth one. And, and it is six and a half minutes long, fully edited, that they do every bit of the ride. It's so <laughs> crazy. And the descriptions as the girl, the little girl who's narrating it, she can't be more than 12, I swear. She needed prompting for the narration that like Judy Dench does once, like, which is so impressive like terrifying and impressive and lovely all at the same Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. so it was really really cool and it's also um i keep this is on my my to read playlist we should do this for play club also i have to be honest play club is 100 percent an excuse to read all these plays that i'm like i should read that and then i don't um is we should do mr burns because it feels very mr burns post-electric a little bit from like all the descriptions I've read where we're just reenacting the things that we know and it's so cool like I I love it and I really need to read that play so bad well what was funny in my directing class two weeks ago it was the last time that we had class uh like in person um I guess about a week and a half ago now um we all went, okay, guys, we're getting ready for a Mr. Burns future. What shows are we going to corner now? Like, <laughs> we need to call dibs now. And so shout out to Nina Dreamer, uh, who was like, yo, uh, Parks and Rec, The Office, Parks and Rec. And I was like, yeah, we'll do Parks and Rec. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, look for your Parks and Rec company. It's going to come out of Central Florida uh, when the <laughs> apocalypse happens. We're, we're kidding, but not. Um, yeah, Mr. Burns is so interesting to think about, especially doing it in that setting, because... Annie Washburn gives you no, like, because there are two versions of scripts you can get. You can get the UK version or the off-Broadway version, and the actor version gives you, like, some of the italics of, like, what stage directions were, Mm -hmm. but, like, generally, the script doesn't give you a lot to work with outside of the text, which I love, because it means you have to create... You have to build the world. Mm -hmm. You have to dramaturgically understand where you are, what's happening, and what's happened to the world, which most theater companies and schools don't do anymore because they just stick to the italics Mm -hmm. and what's in the italics, and they just do what's been created before. And so uh, it's something I really like about that script, which can be really interesting because all of us could have a different perspective of where the world is, especially because that the the play jumps time Mm -hmm. in those three acts. So it's... um, well, I think that's also so smart because um, something that I've been noticing as like I'm getting back into play reading and back into theatrical reading is like, so, okay, so everybody knows the Jerome Robbins choreography of West Side Story. And it's part mm-hmm. of the, one could argue, Ivan Van Ho would not, but one could argue that it's part of the language of the play at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that that's a necessarily bad thing. But also because Mm -hmm. it's become widely decimated, like we have the movie, for example, to prove that choreography, then we can have this kind of almost prescriptive thing and we're still able to capture the feeling. But an off-Broadway show, as beautiful and cool as that may be, unfortunately, just due to the sheer numbers of the thing, not everybody's going to get to see that. 
So Mm -hmm. when we have too prescriptive of stage directions where we can't necessarily understand or ascertain the meaning because we haven't seen it, like, I think it's so smart to go minimal with them because you're accidentally allowing people to capture the spirit more. You know, what is it? Peter Brook. The empty space. Are you about to reference the empty space? Uh, 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 I love the empty space so much. I actually have the book next to me now. Uh, I, which my theater professors at FSU would either laugh or be proud of, um, which is the empty space. Because I, I'm still like I have one chapter left. I keep forgetting to finish it. Um, it's my second or third time rereading it, um, but it's like the difference between deadly and like rough theater. I would mm-hmm. argue, um, like recreation is such a such a fickle beast. Um, Mm-hmm. So yes, yeah, so that was really interesting because like they're totally recreating the rides, but it feels mm-hmm. very like maybe maybe a medium. I don't know, and like yeah, yeah I don't know. It's well, crazy. it's but fu- it's funny also because in that spaceship Earth, um, which I will reshare to our Facebook page just because I think that will bring a lot of people joy right now. Um, that when the fire at Alexandria, the library at Alexandria. Oh which my is god, really this itself, is the best part, guys. <laughs> It's really just a, a it, it is a transitional moment, but it's important because it's one of the most imp- it's one of the most recognized smells from a Disney ride because Disney a lot of people who've never been to Disney or they just go for the thrill rides, which like why there are only like five on property. Um, okay, like seven now. but um like the the smell design of so many of these rides is so important and like the burning of the library at alexandria is one of my favorite smells in the entire universe and so but it's literally just a transition scene of a bunch of fallen wood and like fire effects and i'm i'm doing this wavy arm thing that no one can see but hannah and it's just because it's just a wall of like fabric with mm-hmm. some leds led splashed on it um because that's how we do theatrical fire. fire um but it's literally just a tiny round desk fan flipped up with thin <laughs> red yarn tied to it and it, it's it's the it's, best part it, it is and you focus so on it a little too long and they go around it it is just it's they are so fully committed but that's like, exactly scene, what happens in the ride too is the funniest part yeah. is you're like oh, yeah. you're like wow this every time i ride it i always think wow this sli- this room's a little longer than i remember well and because it's also just a corner because you're turning into the um you're turning into the uh, uh the uh arabian archives mm-hmm. um and and then you're in the printing press and so you're like, oh, or medieval and then printing press. And then you're like, oh, okay. But yeah, that right, that corner is a little long. And that's, you know, uh, Spaceship Earth rip. It's about to go up for a reason. I don't even want to talk about for that. The, for the anniversary. Um, and that's the, can I tell you, that's one of the main reasons why. One, because I'm gone all summer. So physically, if I have to leave now, it means my last trip will have been in March and I will not be back till August, mm-hmm. which will make me so sad because I love Disney so much, mm-hmm. which you know, everyone at home should know. The other podcast is a Disney podcast. I talk about the parks. It's my, it's one of my, you know, anti-psychotics. So like, <laughs> I just, <sighs> you know, it's, but it's, yeah, it's about to go down for a much, much, much needed refurb. But like, we're going to lose Judy Dench. I'm worried we're going to lose one of my favorite audio animatronics, which is our sassy scientist with the giant afro. I, didn't she recently get a toy from Disney, though? Did I read that wrong? Like, I thought six months ago she got she a toy or something. So she may be. Oh, I don't know. She may. She might have. I don't, know. Uh, I don't know. God bless Etsy sellers. That. They're really cool, but sometimes I don't know if they're it's their merch or official merch when I see right. it posted Listen, online. If someone wants to make a really high quality doll of that uh, 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 audio animatronic, I will not mind if you want to send it our way. <laughs> I'm gonna send you our PO box. Um, and support your independent uh, sellers, but also like legally, I have to say, don't infringe on copyright property. <laughs> so. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's a weird. Uh, talking about that side of Disney will make me sad right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also get it because, like, it's their copyrighted characters and things. It's, you know, it's a weird legality as two people who will eventually want to, you know, work there uh, 
or slash will be working there. Yeah, um, manifest it, baby. But, but I love it. Oh, did you see the one this morning? I don't know if I shared it to you. It's on TikTok. Someone recreated a Grand Fiesta tour in their pool. Oh, my God. No, a, I need to see that. A, she's in a kayak, and they have two giant projector screens on other side of the pool and they just have like a dog and a sombrero and like three people playing mariachi music <laughs> it's oh i'm waiting for the well okay so there was kind of a haunted mansion one that one was not as well thought out as the rest but like there's even a festival fantasy parade one i love the oh, pirates the Caribbean okay one. so the thing that i feel like really actually tore this off was the first video i ever saw which i also sent to you which was funny because i sent it to matt and matt was like oh eight people have tagged me up about this in two hours which means that we all know matt's brand very well um, it's so true. Um, which was, there was this woman who, in front of her Disney Monopoly set, literally on a string, just, like, pulled, like, I don't even know, toys from various collections, and then a Jeff Koontz balloon animal doll, and, oh my god, this statue. Okay. So, the, it's the, the, best fucking, part. the fucking balloon, I was like, I'm confused, and then <laughs> a hand reaches in front of it and lights a lighter, so it's the Maleficent dragon, and I... I die. And the thing is, she tied everything in the order of their floats. Mm -hmm. So it was the whole parade, but like one or two toys and like a bunch of floppy zoom zooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was to, to about 35 seconds of the Festival of Fantasy, which everyone should also know is my favorite parade they have ever produced yeah. that I've seen in my lifetime. It's my favorite also U.S. parade. It's, it's the best U.S. parade, I would yeah. argue. Although I've never um, been to Disneyland, so don't fight me. Well, well, their sound station parade was cute. It was really cute, especially like the, the floats were too big for Disneyland because you're so packed in there. Oh, interesting. And, um, I'm not going to call out the new parade. I think I could do a whole podcast episode on it. Uh, for the main show, which actually might be a really good idea. I'll do a bonus from the Magic Happens Parade. I think everyone should go watch it. There's lots of video footage of it. Um, there's some cool things in it. Like there's a really cool Moana. There's a really cool Coco float. There's a sword in the stone float, which I love. I love it's that. Tiny. But there's so a little confused, a but love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's a parade that starts with Mickey. Okay. They did in that in float. Disney, uh, uh, to Disney, yeah. Tokyo Disney. Um, and Thanks. the score is by Todrick Hall. Oh, Disney, wow. Disney and Todrick work together now. Again, all of these things. I, You know what? I'm going to do a bonus episode <laughs> on this this coming week. You all look out for that over on the main show on Do Up and Dreams. Um, yeah, I have a whole thing yeah, about so. trying not to watch videos of stuff I haven't done. Um, and I also try and go in blind a lot because I find that, uh, you know, um, imaginations are great but they often create an anticipation mm -hmm. that like even if it's met it doesn't feel as good as just experiencing something yeah. so i might skip that episode but i encourage everybody else to go listen to maddie talk yeah, about good things it's it's hard because like i really like i love knowing that i want to go back to disneyland i went for the first time last year it was an amazing experience shout out to my friend noah sunday lefkowitz who is an amazing tour guide mm. um to the inside and outs of disney he works in imagineering there i'm so proud of him um but uh yeah the, disneyland was a very different experience i loved the parade that was there it was super cute um and world of world of color which is their california adventure uh, night show i really want to see that course, it's so good. It's and I was just like, it's projections on water. Who fucking cares? And then I cried through it. Um, I taught another queer person that Scar is a gay icon. <laughs> Scar is a gay icon. Um, and but then also like the one thing that sucked was when I was there, Fantasmic was down, and it was supposed to reopen my last day, and it did not. Yes. They extended the refurb week, which you know just another excuse to go back. But with yes. this one, I could when they made a big deal and uh, debuted the parade a day early and. It was all over my Facebook. I went, I honestly don't know when I'll get to go back. I know I start working at Disney World in August, right. but I was like, that means it could be like another two years before I end up back at Disneyland yeah. visiting. So I was like, you know what? I want to see this. Let's see what, it, let's see what it looks like. Cause they've been hyping this since D23. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. Um, so you all will have to go over to the main show, but I also respect that. Cause like, I won't do ride throughs of rides unless it's like, 
I know I'm not going to go to Shanghai anytime soon. Well, oh, we so can talk I, about that. I went to Shanghai Disney. What a cool, great experience. Pirates was down. And then I booked another trip to Shanghai. And this exact virus occurred. And I could not go and ride yep. Pirates. So I feel and pirates, so... And pirates pirates for me is one reason why I want to go to Shanghai. Like that It is, is the draw. primary... Well, no, that's a lie. There were like four it's reasons I wanted to go to Shanghai. One, I am definitely like the kid who had a Pokemon game and tried to catch them all and failed, but I'm trying to fix that with my Disney Parks visitation. Um, two, I really wanted to see all the shows. So this is the one thing mm -hmm. that they cannot seem to transfer the same way that you can plop a ride building everywhere. And it makes me so happy in my soul because different cultures mm -hmm. have different kinds of storytelling right and we have different expectations of storytelling so the famous example of tokyo is that everyone sits for the parades which we would never ever do in america and also i think like something that to me really encapsulates a lot of the the kind of difference in audience expectation is that in the ride nemo sea rider which is a great ride in tokyo disney sea um it's the same kind of ride vehicle as star tours but you are expected to take off your ears. Um, and this way, everyone has an unhindered viewing experience and shares the same thing. Whereas I think in America, I haven't ridden Star Tours in America. I've only ridden it in Japanese, which is like funny. Um, but I was on it again, a completionist goal that day. So I rode like everything I could I have ever not ridden except Space Mountain because I'm still a scaredy cat. Um, <laughs> Matt is pointing at himself in case, you know. Um, but I, um, it was really cool. But I don't know if in America they make you do that because I feel like, no, because we wouldn't expect that of American audiences, which is not a value judgment, just like a statement of fact that in America it wouldn't be an expected behavior to take off your ears or your hat or whatever to unhinder that view. Um, so that's like just a difference. And then, so when you go to mainland China, uh, because of the cultural revolution and other factors, um, people love Disney, right? This is the only thing I found true everywhere I've been. So I've been into, um, some really beautifully cultured rich places. And I've seen some places that have unfortunately like seen the effects of war. And you know what? Even in those war strewn towns, a kid is wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt and there's a Sophia blanket like on their couch. Mm -hmm. It's incredible the reach of this company, really. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it's, but they don't have the tradition of nostalgia with Disney the same way that America does. Mm -hmm. So their storytelling is different. Um, and also Mickey Mouse's voice in Mandarin is a wild ride that I highly recommend everyone look up because if you think Mickey Mouse's voice in English is high, go to Mandarin. <laughs> It's so cute. I literally laughed out loud when I heard it just from like pure joy. Um, Cause, oh man, I, I always joke that like Mickey, Amer Mickey Mouse in English is high. Tokyo Disney's Japanese one is higher and Mandarin is the highest I've heard. <laughs> and it was just great. Um, but yeah, speaking of excuses to go back, my I have to go back and see Pirates and I need the pandemic to end to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's talk about that because entertainment in the American Disney parks is always kind of on a precipice of does it get cut? Do we need it? It doesn't make us any additional money. What are we doing? But people come for the meet and greets, which is entertainment. So like it is this double edged sword where it really enriches your park experience because like Tell me who does not go see Festival of the Lion King when they go to Animal Kingdom. It's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> and Nemo, Nemo is probably my favorite show on property other than maybe Fantasmic, even though it's crunchy. But like from what I've, well, from what I know from like, I watched, you know, when you were there and you were describing just how different like Tokyo Sea is in the way that it is set up. Mm -hmm. um, or Disney Sea in Tokyo, Disneyland. Um, and, but like looking through, there are so many more shows mm -hmm. and so many more entertainment things there. Can you talk, can you just talk about a little bit of the, yeah. the difference of, 
of of uh, kind of entertainment there in their parks versus the American. Yeah, parks. sure. Um, though I don't want to spoil too much because I'm gonna bully you into right. talking about it on your other podcast. Maddie has a second podcast called Dull Whip and Dreams, where we talk about Disney movies and Disney stuff. And you should also go subscribe to my very brilliant friend over there. Um, and you can find that on all your platforms, I think. Um, so do wow, that. Yeah, um, yeah, literally everywhere. Thanks for that, Hannah. You're welcome. I like to plug my friends. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel gross plugging myself, but I love plugging my friends. Um, and uh, okay, so yeah, so I would. Um, so okay, so I've had two friends who visited me who also visited the Disney parks while I was in Japan. Well, they didn't really visit me. They visited Japan, and I was a very happy addition to, like, see them. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's okay. Um, anyway. And, you know, we saw... I went with one group of them to Disney Sea, and they were really cool because they're also Disney humans. I don't think you go across the whole world and then go to a Disney park if you're not a Disney human of some kind. Um and I don't recommend it if you're not a Disney human of some kind, unless you live there, and then I do recommend it. Um, uh, but anyway, side note, hold, whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so they're Disney humans. And, you know, we were talking and I was like, I have this really unpopular opinion among foreigners. Like, no other foreigner I know has this opinion, but I think Tokyo Disneyland is better than Tokyo Disney Sea. Um, and only other Japanese people I've found agree with me, although I'm sure that's not the whole truth. But I find I like Disneyland better because there's more stuff to do. And I very much love looking at my list at the end of the day and going, oh, I rode 14 rides and I saw three parades. I don't know. I, I like that sense of completion. Um, also, I've never been a pass holder, which is for the amount that I like Disney parks, probably funny to people. Um, but I also like them from the sheer volume of like, wow, we are crowd controlling people in a weird way. How are we making a cohesive thing? It's just a giant piece of theater in a permanent place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to me that way. Um, and uh, so, okay, so at Tokyo Disney Sea, I would say that there are not many attractions. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a great park, I think, if you're, like, kind of a lackadaisical or, like, pass holdery kind of vibe of, like, I don't need to do everything today. I like to chill. I like to take in the vibes. Like, then Disney Sea will 100% be your place. It has beautiful, excellent theming um, beyond, like, almost anything. I would say the closest experience I've had in Walt Disney World to their level of theming is probably, um, you know, Joe Rody did an excellent job in Animal mm -hmm. Kingdom. Um, and I do think that uh, Fantasyland has elements of it, um, but I think Fantasyland is also very smartly trying to evoke that kind of circus vibe um, or fun fair vibe, right? That's why so many of it is called, uh, so many parts of it are called like, there's the Dumbo area that's very literally a circus with the big top concessions and yep, everything. Big top circus, yeah. And it's like, um, something is called fair, but with an E at the end because we are old timey. Um, <laughs> festival fair or fantasy fair or something. Yep, yep, that is the castle yeah. show. Yes, yes, yes. So we are mm -hmm. reminding you that you're in a place of pleasure um, versus like I would argue that maybe Animal Kingdom is a little bit more immersion style the way that, because a zoo would also be immersion style. So it's, you know, a lot of things like that. Um, but it's a great, beautiful park, and I grew to love it even more as I would go for it. Um, but because there's not that many attractions necessarily, mm -hmm. I would say that like half of it is shows, and also, right, people specifically like that park because there's not that much to do, so they like that you just walk around and get to enjoy different things. So, because of that, mm -hmm. they promote a lot more of what I think, I think it's called. Ooh, you're going to know the actual word, so correct me. But streetmosphere, I think is what it's technically called in the American mm -hmm, parks, mm -hmm. um, which is walk around entertainment. And I like to call it crowd control entertainment a little bit, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that it's not of great quality. I There have been so many times where I'm like, I'm on a mission to go to Indiana Jones. The ride time is, or the wait time is only 25 minutes. I'm going to make it there. And then there's one of those very cool janitors that was floating around um, the internet for a little while a few years ago um, which is like they like hit things and then like Little Mermaid is playing while they hit things or like they have very real life time sound effects 
to things. Like, there must... I have a theory about how it's done, but I don't want to break, like, the magic because don't do I'm it. not going to do, do that. But I, I think I finally, like, after probably six times of watching the show, I finally have a theory that might have two legs. Um, <laughs> because literally, like, he gives directions and there's very real, well-timed, smart sound effects because he never sees... It's just, like, so cool. I have a video somewhere I can send you. Um... And it doesn't detract from the experience at all. Like, I feel like the idea of crowd control entertainment sounds negative, but it's really not. Um, And part of, right, part of the joy of any experience, whether it's a theme park or you're out shopping or anything, is when you have this surprise factor of something cool. Mm -hmm. So by not necessarily planning these things publicly, but knowing very clearly for their schedule, obviously when things are going to happen, they're able to create these like very novel moments. And like I mentioned actually at the beginning, I think that novel experiences are what kind of bring us a lot of joy. So they're manufacturing novelty, which is such an interesting thing. Um, but yeah, it's such a, such a cool thing that's very different from the way that we would approach it at um, America, or approach it in America. I promise I speak English. Um, <laughs> and I really uh, I hate to say interested because that's what I mean, but it's not what I mean. It's not the right connotation. Uh, how this is going to change post Corona, um, whether or not we like to talk about it, there is there are there are some steps that are going to have to happen, right? Um, and it's gonna be interesting. And for all of you that have very normal lives. Um, all Disney properties that are parks are closed at the moment and I think will be for at least two weeks if I read things right which is um, as a former Florida resident and still a Floridian in my heart like scary because I know a lot of people employed by the Walt Disney World Park Um, I read I read somewhere because I was like reading about this that it's the second biggest single site employer Oh my god, please fact check me. I'm so sorry. That might be all the wrong words. Um, But, you know, in the entire continental US. And so I'm really grateful that they're, like, paying people. But I also have friends who are seasonal who are not getting paid. And Mm -hmm. it's, like, a difficult time because the it's closed. Like, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But I just hope that, like, whatever happens, especially my friends in entertainment, can keep their jobs because... Mm -hmm. You know what? I love them and I care for them. And yes, Disney's great, but also like knowing that my friends can eat is really nice. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is you and I talk about it too, of that like it's a it's a great company for what they do because of the legacy, but also they're really shitty in a lot of ways and they do a lot of things that are just like not right. But it's also because of like, you know, we are so disconnected from the actual Disney family at this point who no longer makes the decisions. And, um, and even then, like, I think there's a lot of misconstrued about, like, who Walt was as a person and the decisions he would have made. Um, and so, you know, it is a business. It is a commodity. Um, as much as we don't want to think about it uh, at that way, it is a, a, a purchasable experience. Um, and so things are going to have to change after this just because, like, a lot of money is lost. Now, do we need to be charging $200 a day to go to Disneyland? Maybe not. Um, definitely not. But, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And this is, I guess, a nice transition into a thing of no one knows what's happening next. And I saw a really great, like, art piece last night that says, we can't go back to normal because what we had before wasn't working either. And so I think knowing that, like, things are going to have to change, but that's okay because things weren't necessarily working well before... Um, like on a grand scheme. Um, so I do want to, I do want to preface this right now of if you are listening to this and you're not kind of in the, uh, a a healthy mental space to be able to like talk about what might be scary us, what might be happening, what we might be afraid of. I'm going to have you guys just skip to the end of the episode a little bit. Hannah and I are going to wrap up, but we're going to talk about more, but I think, um, I don't want anybody to have to go through like unnecessary trauma or, or upset or like, um, panic right now so what i would say is either pop me off go over to our other podcast adult open dreams um binge over there or um 
we'll see you next time. Um, but I think I think both Hannah and I, you and I talked before that we mm-hmm. want to, you know, we're both. We're both so really uneasy right now about a lot of things, and I think this is a good place to talk about that. So, um, yeah, yeah, the there is the uncertainty of everything of like I'm being told by my summer gig that like I'll have my summer gig, like I am there, it is there, it will happen. To it, it'll just depend on when they open, and I'm just going, okay, that's really good, and like I'm supposed to start working at Disney in August, like that's a thing that's supposed to happen. Paperwork is signed, it is done, like but like. What am I going to walk into, I think, is the fear. And for me, it's specifically Disney. I guess that's what we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of people, like all of our friends that are in New York, my sibling is in yeah. New York. Uh, we're a huge, we're still a huge part of that community of like what's happening with professional theater artists there. Like Broadway is shut down for the first time. In a really long time. In a long time. And is shut down across the board. It's not like... It's not like a strike. It's not like a union thing. It's not like a blizzard. Like mm-hmm. a month, Broadway shut down, and we've already had two shows canceled. A lot is not going to reopen. And you and I were just talking about the state of like regional theater because you yeah. know we we're both still you were you're trying to find summer work and all these things. And a lot of these theaters have only canceled their first show, or a lot of the regional theaters have canceled the rest of their seasons if they're ending in May or June. And so there's just a lot of uncertainty specifically for us. So like how, yeah, I know we're trying to talk about finding joy, but like, how is, you know, how are you doing with all of this? Cool. So yeah, so this is a good point. So I'm mm-hmm. planning to go to Barrington um, this summer again, which is where you and I met. Um, I've been really grateful for the opportunities they've given me there. And I'm just waiting on some like paperwork on my end to process. So then I can give them paperwork to process on their end. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the shot. Yeah. The shut of everything has made that much slower than I would like. And also for me, filing taxes has become confusing because I have paid taxes in Japan already, but now I need to tell the U.S. government that I paid taxes in Japan. Otherwise, like Al Capone, they will get me for tax fraud. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't see you doing well in lady prison. No, I don't see me doing well in any of those situations. So we're going to avoid that at all costs. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. It's it's funny. So I loved living in Japan. I want to preface this with. But it was its own form of mm-hmm. isolation as well. And a lot of foreigners who live there and come back after one year will tell you that. Right. And a lot of that isolation is 100 percent my fault. Mm-hmm. So I knew I was moving to Japan and I was like, ah, Japanese will be easy. And then I got there and it was not. And you know what? That is like the arrogance of a 22 year old. Oh, yeah. Man. That's oh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm only 23, so I don't know why I'm saying it. Like, I have this wild worldly wisdom when I don't. But, like, <laughs> at least looking back, I can see that. Um, and then uh, I hung out with some people who are cool, but not necessarily with my tribe. So I went through a lot of like, trying to find the right people and then just like being a little too inexperienced with that where I was like really lucky to have stumbled into the right groups a lot and have really good friends and then I went through like probably three months of not really having a great friend in the same country as me or actually I had two people I knew from FSU but they were living really Mm -hmm. far away from me in Japan right it's a country not a city like it's it's a big distance um and also, I didn't really know how to help, ask for help in a productive way a lot. So I ended up video calling people, um, which was my way of asking for help when I didn't realize it, and getting really great, beautiful conversations with people. So I'm used to kind of long-distance friendship um, until I kind of found my groove there. And even when I found my groove there, you know, what is that saying that Girl Scouts used to make me sing? Um, oh, my gosh. Oh, it's like, what... New friends and old, one is silver and mm-hmm. the other is gold. That's um, the same, right? Make friends keep the old ones, one is silver and the other is gold. Thanks, Barney. Yeah, thanks, so there's, Barney. Thanks, <laughs> bud. I, we definitely had to say that in Girl Scouts, too, um, which everybody goes support Girl Scouts also. Um, and, yeah, it's, like, really weird because I think a lot of people are experiencing something similar to what I felt I was experiencing which is not what I was experiencing right like I could still Mm -hmm. go outside but um and like go to crowded places and like not worry but it's been a really interesting journey of um 
like people adapting to this and I still have to adapt right like I was like I said in a city so even when I was feeling lonely I could go to a place or I could go to Disney Mm -hmm. or I could do different things um so it's different but it's been I know it's been hard on Mm -hmm. people and I know it's been like definitely not easy on me but at least it doesn't feel as hard it seems because like I had a little practice run um (laughs) <laughs> and I had a little practice run of the panic as well. Um, yeah. I was really lucky. Yeah. 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 And I was really lucky. I had really lovely students in Japan who I cannot, like, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for the people who I taught because they were, like, a great reminder of humanity all the time. And, like, you know, I still talk to a few of them. Um, in fact, one of my students, their whole family moved to America. And so um, the mom and I had always, like, My student was, like, eight, but the mom and I had always, like, had, like, two words of conversation and smiled a lot in the lobby, and um, we ended up becoming friendly, and now they're here, and we just talked the other day, or, like, um, my other student reached out to me the other day, and uh, just, like, I'm really lucky, and Mm -hmm. I remember one of them um, when I was, like, yeah, I don't think Corona is, like, that big of a deal. I'll go to Shanghai. They were, like, "Mm, Hannah, I'm really nervous for you. Like, she wrote me at, like, after she knew I was off work. And I used to get off work at, like, 9.30 by the time I walked home. Um, Which I was so lucky to not have to take the train when I was working. I'm really grateful for that, too. Um, And was just, like, I really don't know if you should go. Like, I'm really worried about you. Like, they closed this. And I just think it would be better if you stayed. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's such a kind thing. Um... It's just like, it's just a genuinely kind thing. Um, And, you know, it also can feel a little suffocating when people care about you, Mm -hmm. which is like a weird thing. But it's it's looking back, it's such a kind thing. Um, But yeah, so you get like that. And now I'm I'm feeling like, oh, I got the practice run of that even back then. And now Mm -hmm. um, because the big concern when I was going because Corona hadn't hit Shanghai yet when I was planning to visit was also just that like we never know if they're gonna you know close flights with china um this president of china and this president of america don't seem to get along as well as mm-hmm. past alliances have um and i don't really feel like becoming a political prisoner <laughs> was like the joke i would always make mm-hmm. um so i just didn't want to didn't want to do that um because i have a lot of respect for both peoples of those countries and like i really would love to visit china again Uh, My first visit to Shanghai was only three days or three and a half days long. And it was really cool and busted a lot of my expectations of China. Um, And I was really grateful for that experience. But um, I didn't want to be put in quarantine when I came back because uh, Mm -hmm. just like we're doing now, lots of countries are asking or demanding, depending on the country, like Mm -hmm. that you go into quarantine. Um, which I'm not opposed to necessarily because I would like this virus to stop, but mm-hmm. is a scary thing, especially like when you are living by yourself, right? Um, so I'm really lucky. Uh, I get to be at my mom's house right now, um, and it's so nice not to feel like you have to come home to an empty house, mm-hmm. that you can have a conversation with a person, um, that yeah, you're in kind of quasi quarantine but you at least like (laughs) there is a human being Mm -hmm. with you and it's a good reminder of humanity Mm -hmm. um and i think for like a lot of us in our early 20s uh we're living either with random roommates or by ourselves or with our friends right like and some of us are also living at home um i know for me right now until i well now everything's gone crazy uh because Like you mentioned, we're kind of playing a day by day Mm -hmm. where you have to take it with a grain of normalcy, but also you have to know that maybe things are going to change. You just got to like ride it like a wave is the analogy I keep Mm -hmm. using because there's no point. Like, I don't know where I, I I think it's all the anxiety in my life that gave me a practice run for this, but I know I can't control it. Like, I just got to be zen about it. Um, But yeah, it's... It's hard for people because they don't realize the isolation they've accidentally created for themselves when they don't live with people that they know on that kind of emotionally intimate scale necessarily, Mm -hmm. which is not true for everybody. I know there's like a group of people who I'm acquaintances slash friends with 
um, who live together, and they're very lucky. They have a great chosen family that they're lucky enough to right, live with. Right, absolutely. But that doesn't always work for everybody because rents are different, budgets are yeah. different, locations are different. So it's um it's a whole thing, and I think that it's really funny that you called this show Isolation Cast because that's the name of it, right? Like officially. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, because I think like the things I'm worried about even more than Corona are, we already have a culture of isolation and I'm worried about the economy. Um, I was joking with you last night. So I'm 23, which means I was born in 1996. Sorry. Um, and I grew up and I was like eight years old when the housing recession happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so actually, okay, so the reason I want to jump into this is because I don't know if I'm a millennial or a Gen X, or Gen Z, right, I mean, right. technically, because I I usually identify with millennial culture, but then, like, I guess technically I'm Gen Z, and I don't really care because I love the idea that I'm in an in-between moment, but it's a really interesting thing happening right now. Um, yeah, yeah, for a while, I, I saw it going to 99 was millennials, but then, uh, like, this week, everything says, like, 94 or 95. I also think shoving groups into boxes is what's going to alienate everybody more. But, like, oh, yeah. also it is important because, like, this whole idea that, like, the, the, like, boomer generation is going, oh, my God, it's the millennials. And I'm going, no, most of the millennials are, like, almost 40 and just want mortgages and, like, a pair of shoes that aren't going to make their legs and back hurt. Like, <laughs> that's all yeah. I want right now. <laughs> right. But, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not only millennials existing anymore. That has become, like, kind of the stand-in term to infantilize a group. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so it's been an interesting thing. But either way, I'm, like, in between the two or in the kind of cuspy period. Mm -hmm. So when I was, like, eight, I think, was when the, the housing market crashed, the bubble burst, whatever mm -hmm. we're calling it. And then now I'm 23 and the stock market is in a place that's the end of the sentence for me <laughs> and i know that it will recover in some level and things like that but it is just like as a person who is trying to figure out how to be a working artist i cannot imagine owning a home anytime soon mm -hmm. um although i also did not imagine moving to japan um mm -hmm. and then i did so like i'm not ruling out anything from the universe the universe is like far wiser than I will ever be. Um, and, and yeah, and um, it's weird because I think these two giant financial pieces of history have very much informed my life, whether or not I know it or like I know it, but like to the extent, I don't know. And then, yeah, it's, it's just weird. Um, and then also, so like, Teaching is great, I and mean, I love teaching, but I was so excited to jump back into theater. Um, they're my two loves, and, you know, I like to do them both. So I was, like, so excited, but I was like, oh, I'm going to come back and do theater. And getting a job in theater was harder than I thought, mm -hmm. um, because, again, I'm younger than I like to admit <laughs> with my, like, brain age, I guess. I don't know how to phrase that. I always think I'm smarter than I am, probably, but so does everyone when they're 23. <laughs> and... Um, I really thought like, oh, I have this. And then I got a little overwhelmed with like, what do I want out of a job? And I still didn't have an answer for, I still don't really have an answer. I'm still working on it. But there are things that I know I want. I don't know everything I want, but I know more things now than I did even a month ago. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it was like a whole question of that. And then now, just as soon as I've started to really figure out what I want, like, and I was so lucky to find the Barrington opportunity I did. And I just really, I need to submit that paperwork. That's all on me. But then after Barrington, what will I do? Mm -hmm. um, and things like this. Like, uh, it's really weird because live entertainment and theatrical experiences as a whole are, they're congregations of people. So mm -hmm. we can't have congregations of people for how long and mm -hmm. what do we do? And then there's been all this beautiful digital art coming out of it, but there's been um, the question of legitimacy mm -hmm. with art, right? Like, who deserves to get paid? What's real mm -hmm. art? All of these things. Um, and in the if we can't congregate, how does this change when we get to the digital space? Right. It's an interesting and cool question, but it's also a question that doesn't make me feel super confident about my prospects for employment right. in the near future. Right. Um 
And that does maybe mean that, like, I don't get to do art professionally for a little while, which is not the end of the world, Mm -hmm. but would also suck. Um, And I'm not going to pretend it wouldn't suck. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it's just a lot of questions. Yeah. And we're just having to, like, find certainty with questions. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way that I'm, I'm, I, because, like, I was a quote-unquote grown person when the the housing market and everything fell out in, like, 2006, 2007. I had moved to New York not knowing anything was happening. Was it that late? Oh, my God. Maybe um, I was in middle no, school No, it was, like, already. 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. But we were seeing the, like, Elaine Stritch and Beth Level were doing regional theater, and so, like, nobody was telling non-union actors coming out of Scamda that, like, you're not going to get hired right now, so, like, have mm. fun. Um... And like Broadway was transitioning to like the the what we know now, and like it's um, you know, but I have very skewed memories of that time. So like now, this is mm-hmm. yeah, it's it, there is an uncertainty of knowing what's happening, um, uh, but also being willing to go. You know what? I'm going to go with this um, is like fine, and I can tell myself that until like it actually happens. But yeah, it's. Mm-hmm. The, the uncertainty of knowing how our industry is going to recover because literally almost everybody in our industry union and non are, are laid off right now um, yeah. or completely fired from their jobs. And I know a lot of places did that because it's the only way you can collect. Um, it's the only way you can do it. Except what's funny is no freelancers can collect unemployment. Like it's, it's you're not available for freelancers, which as a designer is most of the designers or like yeah. my, my sibling gets paid as an independent contractor. So it does not include her. And so, but I think it's kind of actually change how entertainment theatrical and film companies run. And there's going to be a demand for unions. There's going to be a demand that no one is like, everyone's on a contract, all these things to ensure that like, God forbid this happens again. Something right. is yeah. more. But um, yeah. but I think we're going to now see changes of people or we're even seeing it politically that like three weeks ago at the last um, debate, everybody was still saying that Bernie Sanders idea of a unified socialism is um, too extreme. But now everyone's literally sitting here going, oh, God, we need help. We need it right now. And it's like, yeah. wow, look well, at all these things that we're about to do that are all technically socialist principles. So mm-hmm. like, well, to me that, you know, that debit card that was proposed a few, a few days ago, that's the horrible thing about quarantine. I will say as a side note is time is such a, mm-hmm. such a thing right now that it feels like it was like three weeks ago, but it was three days ago <laughs> or things like that. Right. Um, we can kind of miss that routine of necessarily like, um, my mom's been really good about like leaving the house and walking and doing things mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But you know, it's still not the same as like going to a job every day for eight yeah. hours and then, but anyway, time is weird. And people were suggesting the, the, the card with like a thousand dollars on it every month, which is very similar to what Andrew Yang's UBI mm-hmm. universal basic income is. Um, and you know, like people who want the thousand dollars for, highly opposed to UBI. Um, and I'm still getting educated on this, so I don't want to speak on it too right. much, right? And also, um, luckily, the policy is evolving every day, um, hopefully in the direction of clarity. Um, but, yeah, we're just figuring it out all together as a nation, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, it's uh, quite quite the interesting thing. Um, compared to how a lot of Asian countries who have a little bit more um, of these social programs have been Mm -hmm. dealing with it. Yeah. That's the thing is it's nothing new to most countries in the world where screaming whether it is a human right or not. Like, and there are countries where like, for some reason, Americans consider themselves the best and like that all these other people are literal to use the uncouth term of like, uncultured savages and just like the the aspect of English makes people worthwhile or not and I was like listen I'm from the south 90% of people down here cannot speak English so like oh my god <laughs> and they are born in America they are American they speak English but like they can't speak English um, you know but it's one of those things that those are the people who are ultimately making the decisions and like that's just it's a dark time because we don't know what's happening in the immediate future 
Yeah. Well, I think we're we as you know society as humans as everybody and I I, I from my understanding is this is a universal concept. Mm-hmm. Like we we like knowing what's gonna generally happen tomorrow. Like we do love surprise as we very much mentioned before, and we like new things. But we like also like knowing like oh tomorrow I can do this and tomorrow I can do that. And I know for me like when I was living in Japan, one of the great comforts was. I would always have health care in that I wouldn't ever like die on the street of homelessness, probably um, as long as I was working for that country or working in that country, I guess is actually the phrasing because I was not a Japanese government mm-hmm. employee. Um, and, you know, I would really love to say that America can do that, but that's not the truth from an institutional perspective. Um, and yeah, I think that's what's giving a lot of Americans anxiety right now. Um, you know, and I, I think that that's not an unfounded thing, I guess. Like Mm -hmm. I've, uh, we've looked through history and seen a lot of the good of people, right? We don't, we have food banks. Nobody makes us have food banks. Um, Mm -hmm. nobody makes us do nice things for other people. Once you reach the age of 18, Mm -hmm. like maybe when you're six, your parents drag you somewhere, but like. Once you live outside the house a little bit, you're the one responsible for your actions and people still do good things. Um, We just have to learn to do them in this very strange time. And we also have to trust that, like, yeah, it's shit. Mm -hmm. And stop sugarcoating it. And then, I don't know, there's this freedom once you admit that a situation is shit that just, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's really difficult to say. Um, but like, we have to know that something is going to change positively and it's just a horrible mix of uncertainty. But like I said, I've just been, my anxiety has been training me like this is the Olympics my whole life. So I just, yeah, I think it's like so hard because it's stupid to pretend that like, I don't sit here anxious. Mm -hmm. I do so much of the time, but also like, then you got to do something else too. It's, like, horrible because you just have to, like, drag yourself out of it, which sounds... It's impossible to do, but that's why I have, like, why Thomas and I started a virtual play club, I feel like. Yeah. Like, even if my whole day is horrible and I feel like I did nothing all day, I have to read a play and I have to go talk to you and other people. And I can at least, like... Like I said, I'm a completionist. I like checking things off my list. I can at least check off, oh, today I talked about a play that I didn't talk about before. Right. And it's, like, terrible that sometimes that's what it really only feels like, which is, you know, not true, but it's what it feels like. (laughs) But at least it's something. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think we've got to find those moments of what helps us maintain normalcy and develop a new new routine. And then I think after this, it's actually going to help people focus on themselves and, like, what brings them life and brings them happiness more. Because, like... Mm -hmm. Um, I used to be that person that was like, well, this is the expectations of my industry and my industry must come first. And like over the last few years, I've been like, this is the expectations of what I'm paid for in my industry and what my job expects and what needs to happen. Other than that, this is me and this is my life. And I need to make sure there are things that like my life cannot constantly operate around the company I'm working for or operate around my job or my job is not my existence. My career is not my, Mm -hmm. it's not my defining feature. So I think it's, I think hopefully there are some really good things that will come out of this like that. And like people reconnecting and realizing how easy it actually is to reach out to people. And I'm hoping the trend of, Oh, I'm just really bad at texting will go away. Um, there are just little things that I think it's way easier to be personal and we've developed this weird fear of socializing and reaching out to people and talking to people that I think, which I even have, but I think will go away now and which I'm really Mm. hoping for. Um, so Hannah, I think that's a nice view. So as we wrap up, um, where can our friends find you online? Um, you can't and i like it that way um i've decided that my online consumption is for people who know me um if you really want to check out some of my personal work you can check out my slightly outdated website which is hannahcats.weebly.com um and if you want to offer me a job please email me (laughs) based on the website um 
I really need some work. Um, and I really need to like do that. Um, uh, but I've decided generally that my, um, existence online doesn't have to be a public platform. Um, I was, so when I was traveling, I was really, really lucky. I had some leftover scholarship money and some lovely friends and family who let me backpack after university, um, with their assistance. And, so much of people I know, so much, so many, I swear I speak English. So many people I know were like, why don't you make a blog? You can get a free hotel stay. You can do this. And I just decided like not every aspect of my life needs to be commodified. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it would have been really nice if I had made like a hundred bucks a month doing things I was already doing, or I'd gotten a free hotel here and there. But what's even more nice is like having a sense of privacy in an increasingly less private world. Um, by the way, the government right now, because we're dealing with Corona, is trying to pass a few laws that kind of decimate our privacy online. So I encourage people to go. That's what I'll plug. Not myself, but please go read up about that and then call your senators if their phones are actually on. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I please don't find me online unless you want to see the work I've done. I've uh, at my website, um, which is again, probably slightly outdated by the time this posts. Um, yeah, but, um, Great. please enjoy your own privacy, advocate for yourselves. I love that. Um, and, uh, yeah, be smart and do cool things and try not to go insane when you live inside your house. Great. Well, that was going to be my last question is if you had one term of advice or something to help other people spark joy, what would that be? But I think you just, I think you just gave us that. So yeah, go advocate for yourselves. No one else is going to do it for you. That's the only lesson life has consistently taught me my whole life. Oh, that's incredible. That is, that is an absolute brilliant thing. So thank you, Hannah, for being on the show today. I appreciate of it. Of course. Thank you for having me. What a lovely thing I get to check off my list today. <laughs> Once again, thank you for joining us for Isolation Cast, presented by Dole Whip and Dreams. You can find us on Facebook at Isolation Cast or at Dole Whip and Dreams Podcast. You can find us on Instagram at Dole Whip and Dreams. You can find us on Twitter at Dole Whip Pod. And as always, check out our website, www.dolewhipanddreamspod.com. Now, go out and find your joy. <laughs>